so today uh, we're happy to have our own local speaker, Masaomi Ono-san. Right, so uh, Ono-san join us in this uh, fall, uh, October. October. And previous, previously he was in uh, Niken yes. in Japan. So Ono-san got his PhD in 2011 uh, from Kyushu University. And he's an expert on quote supernova and uh, also nuclear physicist. And today he uh, will be telling us about three-dimensional hydrodynamic models of coca supernova from explosion to uh, their supernova remnants. Let's welcome also. OK, uh, thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction. I expected Ken is here, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I will start my talk. So my uh, interest is, as I yeah, here in the title, mm -hmm. the evolution from the core class supernovae to the supernova remnants. Basically, the two fields, core class supernovae and supernova remnants, are somehow independent fields. And there are very little uh, study to connect the, these two fields, because uh, spatially and uh, in time, there are very uh, uh, yeah, gap in between the time and uh, scales. And uh, I will talk about the yeah, related uh, our project. Yeah, I'm partly conducting the supernova to supernova remnant uh, project, fo mainly focusing on the core cup supernova. But uh, anyway, I will talk about uh, this project as an introduction. Yeah, the, this is a brief uh, outline. First, our uh, supernova to supernova remnant project. And uh, mainly today, I focus on the uh, specific uh, object, for example, uh, supernova 1987 and uh, uh, Cassiopeia A supernova remnants. And uh, yeah, this is brief uh, input. And uh, first, as an introduction, as you may know, but uh, what is the mechanism of Crop supernovae. Uh, currently, theoretically, it is understood that the uh, core crop supernova uh, canonically happened by the delayed neutrino uh, heating mechanism. And uh, to do obtain a successful explosion, some uh, mechanism or some multidimensionality, uh, for example, the convection uh, to mix something and uh, some fluid instability, uh, so-called so standing application shock instability is uh, necessary. This is uh, one of the recent uh, simulation results. And uh, here is the entropy distribution as shown. The, as you can see, the morphology is very clumpy. You can find the clump-like structure like here. And uh, on the other hand, there are additional uh, mechanisms for the core crop supernova. This is a kind of uh, magnet rotationally driven uh, supernova explosion. And if the progenitor star is rapidly uh, rotating, and uh, if the star has a uh, inner magnetic field, yeah, the around the direction of the rotation, uh, some jet like structure, you may find some thing, uh, this feature as shown. This is also some uh, uh, result for the numerical simulation. Anyway, ah, okay. But uh, these two types of uh, explosion, and uh, yeah, as you can see, this is asymmetric. And uh, if we see the central region, the distribution is uh, uh, actually different. And uh, on the other hand, from the observation. So just to put this in the yes. Um, when you say magneto rotationally driven, yes, you imagine a magnet at the center, or what, what, what does that word mean? Uh, for example, the, in the accretion phase before the core crops, accretion uh, may uh, uh, amplify the magnetic field during the yeah, core crops. And uh, if the, yeah, and the. Uh, the collapse is in the iron core before it collapses. Before the crops, yeah, uh, magnetic field. Uh, I mean, the during the crops, during the crops, the yeah magnetic field. I mean, the if for example, 
uh, polyital magnetic field of this debuting. And it's the four o'clock subway, the matter uh, uh, amplified, I mean, the con contract to the central region due to the. Uh, so, crux. I mean, Ken was telling me this morning about these, what he calls these super luminous supernovae that are exploding by a, but what you was, I think what you're saying, maybe it's different. Magnetic fields amplified from a magnetar, and then the magnetar rotates and explodes the star. Is that what, is that what this is? Maybe the, yeah, I, I mean, the order may, might be different from the magnetar in this case, but uh, uh, generally, if the magnetic field amplified the order of 10 to 15 Gauss, in this case, the magnetic pressure can uh, overcome the uh, the crops in matter and uh, some uh, ejection may happen. And but, uh, but Ken tells me, Ken tells me he calls a magneton, but you don't. Mm. That's the difference. It's the same object, different. but it's a different name. Yeah, and some sometimes it may be the same, but uh, sometimes uh, different. I mean, if the matter, if this object is not the magneton, some, some uh, ejection jet can be obtained. It is not necessarily magneton. Okay. So, and on the other hand, uh, this is uh, obtained from the uh, observation of the supernova remnant. This is the case of the uh, Cassiopeia A. And uh, as you see, the, there are very clumpy structure, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, the green one is actually the uh, came from iron, and the red one is uh, coming from the more lighter intermediate elements. And uh, if we assume that the uh, stellar evolution is uh, spherical, in this case, and the explosion is spherical, the high, the yeah, heaviest element in, the, in this case, ions, should be the innermost region. And, uh, but the observation shows that uh, some feature ion is uh, maybe seen outside the intermediate element. So what is? the cause of uh, this strange distribution. This is one uh, interesting uh, thing. And so we try to yeah, connect the, the, these two uh, objects from the explosion to the supernova remnants. And uh, between this, you, you know, the initially the uh, system is optically thick, and we cannot uh, obtain any uh, electromagnetic signal at the beginning of the explosion. But uh, yeah, as the ejecta is uh, expanding and the supernova shock uh, propagating the, uh, the inner project, projector structure, finally, the, when the system becomes optically thin, the, we ob yeah, observe the, this object as a so-called supernova. And uh, after that, and... Optically thin, uh, you mean one year is optically thin or 1,000 seconds is optically thin? Uh, after, after, yeah, definitely after, since, yeah, 1,000 seconds. So Just we, after. we see this after 1,000 seconds? Depending on the size of the projector stuff, but the order is uh, something, some order can be, yeah, different, depending on the structure of the projector stuff. But uh, roughly, yeah, and the young supernova element is uh, a few, yeah, 100. Yes, for young supernova remnant. And uh, during this, yeah, what is happening is uh, actually yeah, unknown. I will uh, introduce, but uh, during the, this, when the supernova shock wave propagating to in the inner progenitor star, uh, some mixing uh, happened. And uh, this uh, mixing uh, can change, yeah, yeah, anything. I mean, so, the system is just uh, not a uh, serious similar uh, something, but uh, yeah, during the propagation, something, yeah, some mixing can happen depending on the progenitor structure, and uh, this is this is why yeah yeah numerical uh, simulation, uh, in particular in 3D is necessary. So by mixing, you say okay, so this between 1,000 seconds and 500 years, it's all um, set of Taylor or what? What's, what which which? Luck, one? Luckily, yeah some kind of uh, free expansion at some uh, time scale. But uh, yeah, uh, 
the yeah, time scale of the yeah, Sigur Taylor phases, some deceleration may uh, change the phase of the free expansion. But uh, this happened yeah, between yeah, this. So if you're doing the free expansion, you want to consider the mixing instabilities. I, I, I'm saying that before the, yeah, uh, before the shock breakout, mixing happened. Before yeah. shock breakout? Before the shock breakout, yeah. Of course, after the shock breakout, during the supernova phase, some mixing also happened, but the uh, scale is different here. And uh, so, yeah, then, this is a uh, time sequence, and uh, what we are doing is using uh, some, uh, yeah, stellar evolution models, yeah, realistic, <coughs> as much as, and, uh, yeah, I perform the three-dimensional hydrodynamics uh, for the corporate supernova, and the further evolution can be uh, at some point using the, this result, yeah, Collaborator can follow the further evolution using the MHD uh, simulation code. And uh, not only doing just a simulation, but also we try to, uh, to uh, estimate some observable. For example, mm -hmm. one thing is uh, uh, optical light curve. Still, the, yeah, we are in the primitive stage, but uh, one example is optical light curves, and another example is uh, X-ray uh, during the supernova remnant phase. And also, uh, yeah, yeah, by connecting this sequence, we may say something on the properties of the neutron star and the progenitor star, or about the mechanism of the corporate of supernova. This is our uh, motivation. And uh, similar uh, project. Today I'm focusing on the corporal supernovae, but uh, for the type 1 A supernovae, yeah, there are a uh, similar project. Uh, my colleague is conducting the similar project. And if you are interested in, you can, yeah, uh, yeah, check the, his papers. And so I'm focusing on the 1988 supernovae. As you know, this is uh, one of the most famous supernova since from this uh, supernova we yeah, detected for the first time the neutrinos from the supernova. And uh, one thing interesting is that around the supernova, there are some uh, strange ring-like nebula, as you can see. That this nebula is observed uh, after the detection, after the discovery of supernova. And this ring is uh, uh, found by illuminating, uh, illuminated by the supernova light. And uh, one uh, yeah, mystery is uh, what makes this kind of ring-like structure. And uh, as you can see, yeah, there are actually three rings, the inner equatorial ring and the outer two rings. There are three rings. And uh, historically, from the observation of the early uh, observation of 87 May, uh, this is uh, the observation of the iron line profile. And the uh, horizontal one is uh, velocity. And so you may, uh, you may understand that this is uh, due to the top plus shift. Mm. And the uh, red shift type, the blue shift side, you can recognize, and the uh, distribution is uh, asymmetric. This insists that the uh, uh, explosion may be yeah, actually globally asymmetric. And uh, as you can see in the previous time, actually this is the distribution <coughs> of ejecta. Ejecta seems globally yeah, elongated like this. And uh, this is uh, somehow uh, consistent with the uh, image. The image. And uh, actually, from the observation, uh, this observation suggested that the iron should have uh, the velocity larger than 4,000 km per second. Uh, this is actually uh, very high. 
uh, it is difficult to obtain such kind of high velocity using uh, yeah, spherical uh, series. So this means that, uh, as I will talk about in the next slide, but uh, suggesting that some uh, necessary need for the matter mixing, and also, as I said, some asymmetry is necessary in the explosion. So when I say mixing, that this uh, station is something like this. Yeah, if the station is spherical uh, case, uh, this is uh, yeah, some schematic picture of the radial velocity in that shock. And uh, nickel 56 is uh, synthesized by the exploded nuclear synthesis at the uh, very uh, innermost region. And uh, nickel 56 are uh, radioactive, so decayed to uh, uh, iron 56 later. So Can we go back to the previous slide? Yes. Um. Yeah, you said it's an iron 2 line. Is this a, what wavelength is it? Are you sure this is an iron coming from the signal of ejector, not industrial iron? Uh, I I forgot the uh, wavelength is some around the micrometer. It says eighteen Ten. micrometers on your slide. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, eighteen micrometers. <laughs> yes. Okay. It's forbidden line. Mm -hmm. So forbidden line has mm -hmm. critical density. So density has can be very high. Yeah, so yeah. So it's it coming from the actually ejector. So density is high. Yeah, but. Uh, Forbidden line. It's forbidden line, you said. Ah, yeah. Forbidden line has critical density. So what is the critical density for this line? Uh, for this transition. So then, I, I don't remember. So maybe later, I, I will. Uh, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't well, know. I'm not kind of surprised that supernova rejection is such high density it can have forbidden line. Mm -hmm. Only low density material can have forbidden line. Okay, anyway, let me check so, later. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. thank you for the comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so the previous observation show suggesting something like this, the innermost nickel uh, conveyed to outer region due to some mechanism. I call this is a mixing. Yes, the what is the mechanism of the mixing? Uh, there are a bit uh, more than maybe 20 years history, but uh, uh, one most uh, promising first idea is uh, some fluid instability, yeah. like uh, Lady Taylor instability. This may uh, yeah, happen in the supernova uh, environment. And another one is uh, maybe uh, symmetric exposure itself may help to convey the innermost nickel to outer layers mm -hmm. to obtain the high velocity uh, iron. And actually, the such kind of mixing is uh, uh, depends on the uh, progenitor structure. For example, this is a calculation of the kind of neutron-driven explosion uh, simulations, three-dimensional. And uh, this two, uh, it's uh, differences between the different progenitor star model. Mm -hmm. And the uh, distribution shows the uh, velocity of the uh, nickel or iron. And uh, you see the, this kind of filamental structure. This is uh, caused by a uh, uh, relative instability. And such an instability actually depends on the progenitor structure. Mm -hmm. just, just to see, so you think this is a valid tailor. So the the neutrino fluxes as a topic. Uh, yeah. And then you've, got, then you've got the scale the region where you heat the material. So you, get, mean, so you generate high enthalpy and the outside is low enthalpy and that makes you really tailor. I mean, the explosion can be, yeah, can be uh, something with the initial one, initially, but the really tailor instability can help the evolution depending on the uh, progenitor structure due to the instability. I mean, this distribution is not only the Rayleigh Taylor instability, but uh, initial asymmetry also. Uh, okay. I think I'm asking something much more simple than that. So a star 
is it can never have a entropy inversion because it, it'll convect otherwise. So the star is either, I don't know, whether your star is meant to be radiative or it's, it's convective. If it's mm -hmm. convective, you've got constant <coughs> entropy. What are these? Is this star, is this star convective? For the massive star, the region of the core is highly convective. Convective. So this, yeah. this region being plotted is convective. Is that yeah, right? But, uh, but uh, let, me, let me answer this <laughs> question. So, sorry. This, so the, why do you want to understand how this ray terror disability form? Yeah, why is it right. unstable? Yeah. So the, the key thing about this ray terror instability form was not due to the internal, the core of the massive star or the exposure. So the early phase of the neutrino driven exposure is that it boils the, the water, yeah. so the lot of instability. And then there's a very strong shock wave coming out. But when this shock wave propagates in the interior of the star, shock wave slow down. It slow down will driven the reverse shock. Also mm -hmm. this reverse shock will create a pressure ingredient from the inner and outer. So this fulfill the radiator is a bit. Your density inner is higher, outer is lower, but reverse yes. shock just reverse pressure. So that drive the, this interface become unstable. That create this instability you saw on this on the image. So the instability is on the reverse shock in the boundary. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, actually, this is the distribution for kind of density uh, profile of the progenitor star. And uh, up the value is actually density times uh, radius cubic. And if we see in this uh, dimension the, uh, this progenitor profile, when the shock wave propagating the, this increasing trend phase, the shock wave is uh, decelerated. And uh, as Ken said, uh, the supernova ejecta is basically in a part of the. I'm very curious because um, there are two mm -hmm. things you need. You need, a, well, I'm saying, you need an acceleration and you need mm -hmm. an entropy um, I I I inversion. So if you plot instead of rho r, r squared, if you, if you plot en specific entropy. Uh, mm -hmm. As for the radiative instability, yeah, entropy gradient are uh, not necessary. What? Just uh, if we say the radiative instability. But you are is, is, is you making a chemical composition inversion? No. Either you either you have a composition inversion or you've got an entropy inversion, isn't it? No. Oh, ah, okay, yeah. in this sense. Yeah. Because you've got, to put so a light, you've got to put a heavy fluid on top of a light fluid, and the heavy fluid is either heavy because it's got low entropy or it's because of a different composition. And in your case, the composition is the same, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in so the case. So, so the therefore, you've got a low entropy on top of a high entropy, so we can just plot it and you would see it, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's fun. The way, is a way to approach this problem is more fundamentally using the entropy. You are right. So mm -hmm. if the entropy gradient is like uh, in this weather, the inner is higher, outer is lighter, then it will automatically create this uh, more like buoyancy instability. I don't know. It will turn over this. And the mm -hmm. thing about the simple way is very tailored instability. Just put on the heavier fluid, high density, on the top lower density. Then you, the, like the, then you will stink because the heavier fluid tend to go to the atom and then it create this kind of very heavy structure. This is also similar to try to explain is the, the condition is uh, the pressure gradient, the PDR and the D rho DR is minus times more than zero. So in this the same way is using the density itself. So the density for inner ejecta is higher. But this pressure is lower because there's a reverse shock create this pressure inversion. So during that interface will become the instability. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe I need to think about this offline. I think this uh, I, I don't quite follow because mm. the original star, if it was entropy constant, mm. you've got to change two things. You've got to change both the acceleration yeah, and yeah. the entropy yeah. structure. And uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to see how it actually works. But anyways, you, you should keep going. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> Technical. So anyway, yeah, progenitor star structure is uh, important. And what is the progenitor star of the 18th century? This is fortunately we identified the yeah the star before the explosion. And uh, necessarily, yeah. Uh, observational constraint is something like this. Yeah, luminosity, effective temperature, and uh, one thing interesting is uh, this star should be 
20,000 years ago, the vista should be led to a red supergiant. But uh, before the core crops, it is a uh, blue supergiant. And uh, this is uh, one uh, yeah, difficult point. And another thing is nebula abundance is somehow anomalous. And uh, this is maybe related to the yeah, scenario how to make the, this progenitor star. And uh, related uh, topic I will talk about later. And uh, if we obtain the, uh, if we want to obtain the uh, constraint from the observation, and uh, observation is this gray, gray region. And uh, this one is the uh, evolution of the stellar evolution model in the HL diagram. And uh, observation yeah, shows that uh, to 20,000 years ago, it is red supergiant. But uh, after that, yeah, it should be the, to a blue supergiant in the HL diagram, like this. And uh, this situation is uh, very difficult to obtain uh, with uh, assumptions of the single star evolution. In this case, it is uh, necessary that uh, some uh, very fine tuning of the parameters if we use the spherical and the single star evolution models. And uh, relatively recently, the, this possibility is uh, proposed Maybe the progenitor star with this array is uh, made by the binary merger. This is schematic picture, but uh, if the main red supergiant and the companion is uh, main sequence star, yeah, this is uh, made uh, some binary system. And uh, after that, it may yeah, make a common envelope phase. And finally, it uh, merge to a blue supergiant. And in this case, during the, the merging uh, phase, some asymmetric yeah, mass ejection can happen. And after the collapse to the blue supergiant, and the blue supergiant wind can set up some materials. And in this case, the ring like three ring structure can be formed. And this is one uh, yeah, example of from the yeah, simulation uh, estimation. And actually, this scenario may uh, overcome many issues uh, found in the observational constraints. Because to see, so if an internet merger, and one light year, uh, how long ago is a merger? A thousand years? Uh, the, maybe so, ma merger may happen, the, uh, yeah, at least. Uh, I mean, the, after the merger, it should be that. No, no, I'm asking how many years ago? So, so, so this 1987? It was in, no. in, in 987? Around, or around 20,000. 20,000 yeah. years ago. So it's a, very, it's a very slow ejector moving at 30 kilometers per second out. And of course, you know, 20,000 years later, you move one light year, and that's the, and that's the, blue, the two blue rings. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. okay. And then the inner ring, I just don't understand the, the picture here. And then the inner ring, um, it's the wind from the blue supergiant. Mm -hmm. and, um, but for it to be a ring, you need a velocity and a time. So what's the time and what's the velocity of that wind? Uh, yeah, I do remember the yeah, number. But uh, at least it should be the velocity of scale of the, at the red supergiant stage and the blue supergiant stage is very different. And, uh, like a hundred yeah. years or a thousand years? Um, yeah, <laughs> let me talk about this thing. Yeah. yeah. So I think that the main item of the so I think that if it is a ray supergiant, cost the dust during one week, so the velocity is like a, maybe a few hundred kilometers per second. But uh, for the hard wing, in this case, maybe it will be those of several thousand. Maybe the order may be different between the velocity. Mm. So between the I wind mean, and the ejector, I think so the wind is slow. So it's all, they're both twenty thousand years old. Mm. So the I was I would think the the ejector will move slower than the wind. Okay, so the wind is younger because the wind is on the inside. Mm. Yeah. So it's much more recent. Mm. Yes. 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 The red supergiant wind would have velocity up to about 50 kilometers per second. Mm. It's slow mm. wind. Yes. Mm. So don't call it ejector. It's just 
Let's throw it down and win. It's not like one boom that you got things are ejected like that. The mm. slow wind is but, accumulating. But the ejector is even much slower, right? So the wind is still very fast compared to the ejector. If it's 20,000 years and only, only one light year, that's one of the 20,000. What 20, ejector are you talking about? You're talking about supernova ejector or the... No, no, I'm thing? talking about the outer two rings. He, he explains it from the ejector from the merger 20,000 years ago. So if you move one light year in 20,000 years, you move at 15 kilometers per second. Which is Once not, which is even much, much slower. I mean, that's really slow, and then mm -hmm. of course you get the slow stellar winds, much younger, mm -hmm. but much faster. That's it. You know, the, the merger will cost something like a kind of envelope evolution. You can mm -hmm. go read the uh, Ricker's mm -hmm. book, uh, paper. Ricker and uh, Brown. I'm, I'm just doing some math here. One light year divided by 20,000 years. No, it's, it, it has something about the common envelope. Evol Evolution. You have two stars, you have a common envelope, and the two is ejected. You can call it ejecta, you know, whatever. It's an envelope is ejected slowly. The bathroom blows on it. So it's kind of like a bipolar nebula. So the triple ring is really bipolar nebula. You're looking at the, the mm -hmm. breadth ring, yeah, inner yeah. ring is really the waist, and the two rings outside is just like the, the, the lobes. So you think they're the same age? The what? You're saying that the inner ring and the outer rings are the same, the material left yeah, at the same yeah, age. Yeah, yeah. They're both 20,000 so years old. It's not triple explosion or something. No, it's not three triple explosion. Yeah. Well, all three triple rings triple. are made by a uh, kind of the uh, same one. And uh, just uh, Bruce Baja intervened a little bit to uh, yeah, modify the distribution. And uh, both the inner ring and the outer ring are, yeah, the velocity is consistent with the uh, red supergiant wind. It's the blue supergiant wind interacting with the material ejected previously and form this nebula. Yeah. This one is maybe made by the, yeah, the margin phase in the ring. And uh, then the, uh, yeah, the one is made by the during the margin phase. And the blue supergiant wind uh, swept up this. But uh, this is dense, so dense. So the structure is just uh, uh, remaining. Um, this question. You see a lot of point in the nebula look like this, same mechanism. Okay, yeah, anyway. So, and uh, so actually the, so radial instability is uh, anyway just, de yeah, depending on the projectile st structure and recently the uh, there are some proposals for the binary merger, and uh, it is nice to yeah, investigate the impact of the binary merger progenitor star. This is uh, about the uh, uh, progenitor star of 87 a and uh, recently, yeah, uh, observationally, some other interesting things uh, uh, reported. This is uh, observation by ALMA, and uh, observed the inner region of the ejector of 87 And for the first time, the ALMA yeah, detect, detected, uh, I mean, the carbon monoxide and silicon monoxide rotational line in a three-dimensional view, something like this. And as you can see, the carbon monoxide distributed somehow ring-like, and the uh, silicon monoxide uh, somehow in the part of the ring. And this may show that uh, also the ejector or explosion is asymmetric from, uh, yeah, from the observation. And uh, another thing is uh, ALMA uh, follow up the AP78 in the, yeah, for the emission from the dust. Mm -hmm. And uh, ALMA observed, uh, yeah, the also dust emission and uh, ALMA found some uh, uh, kind of uh, hot spot of the dust emission. And uh, to explain the, this kind of uh, yeah, hot uh, region, maybe some additional uh, heating mechanism is necessary. The mechanism is not uh, unknown, but uh, one uh, suggestion is it is coming from the, uh, from the neutron star. Maybe the thermal or non-thermal emission from the 
uh, yeah, still undetected neutron star. Since the ejecta is still uh, yeah, thick, and around the dust is uh, surrounded, and uh, some emission from the neutron star is now uh, mostly absorbed. But uh, in, the near, yeah, yeah, in the future, maybe we may find some uh, evidence of the neutron star of 87 a And uh, so additionally, yeah, we may uh, insist that the chemical uh, composition, so silicon monoxide and the carbon monoxide, and uh, ejecta is also interested in, in the point of view of pre-solar grain. And uh, pre-solar grain is uh, yeah, kind of uh, a grain found in the meteorites. And some grain has uh, uh, isotopically uh, anomalous and so called uh, yeah, type X silicon carbine grain has uh, some uh, anomaly for the avant yeah, isotope ratio. And this insisted that uh, yeah, this crystal uh, grain may be uh, coming from the supernova ejector. Since uh, the, this uh, to obtain the, this isotopic ratio, maybe yeah, this is kind of a one dimensional explosion theory. Uh, and uh, this is come the yeah, yeah mass coordinate, and uh, here definitely the some uh, structure uh, stratified structure is found, mm -hmm. and uh, to obtain the this silicon carbide, maybe we need to mix the material in this region and the material in this region, mm -hmm. yeah, away from this. Mm -hmm. So some mixing is uh, necessary uh, in order to yeah, get the silicon carbide. Uh, type X silicon carbide. This is the one uh, motivation uh, is why micro mixing is important and uh, why we need to yeah, investigate the uh, uh, chemical evolution. And so, yeah, let me show the, some example. I'm not going to the details, but uh, using the hydrodynamic simulation, yeah, ad hoc way, it's ad hoc way, we uh, yeah, kind of uh, Obtain the some bipolar like explosion by distributing the initial velocity field as asymmetrically, something like this, with uh, some clamping structure and uh, with a uh, small chemical reaction, uh, nuclear reaction network, we follow the synthesis of the nickel 56. And uh, here is the result. Uh, I will show that the 2D slice of the evolution of the density, the left panel shows the uh, uh, result of the binary measure, and the right one is uh, in a single star evolution, just uh, differences the only the probability star, and the uh, explosion asymmetry is the same. And uh, as you can see, bipolar light explosion is happened, and uh, during the Supernova shock wave propagation, you see the some, uh, yeah, evolution of the finger like structure. This is uh, made by the Leviter instability, and uh, just the difference is the progenitor star, and the uh, result is uh, something, yeah, this uh, same model I show here the uh, uh, representative distributions of the element. Mm -hmm. That one is uh, Nickel 56, and the green one is silicon and oxygen, and uh, cyan is uh, helium. And uh, just uh, be due to the differences of the progenitor model, the elemental distribution is somehow defined something like this. And uh, actually, using this model, yeah, some of the for example, this uh, figure is corresponding to the uh, iron line profile. And uh, due to the, thanks to the asymmetry imposed, the yeah, distribution of the corresponding distribution of iron line is uh, relatively well explained with a uh, yeah, binary major progenitor model. And uh, this, this support, uh, yeah, once the binary measure scenario from this, uh, from my uh, simulation results. 
and uh, using this uh, simulation results, yeah, the collaborator Salvatore Oblando uh, kindly followed the evolution further, and uh, he uh, synthesized the X-ray emission. And uh, actually, this is the uh, evolution of the uh, X-ray synthesis. Uh, upper panel is the total, and the uh, bottom panel is the uh, yeah uh, from the each uh, mm -hmm. component from the ring or from the surrounding eight region or from the ejector. And uh, mm -hmm. so, we using this model, we nicely uh, explain the observed light curves, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe the light curve is uh, contributed. To First from the H2 region, and uh, next from the ring, and uh, finally from the ejector. And uh, using the, this uh, result, for example, very crudely, we yeah, approximate, approximately estimate the distribution of the carbon monoxide, silicon monoxide, just, uh, yeah, just multiplying the two abundance. This is uh, may not the uh, realistic one, but this is just a demonstration. But uh, even though uh, we may qualitatively uh, uh, explain some ring like uh, structure for the carbon monoxide as observed, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, yeah, final this is a very primitive way, and uh, as uh, I will uh, introduce later, mm -hmm. uh, more. Uh, yeah, more well, nice uh, theory is necessary to mm -hmm. confirm that this is really uh, yeah, okay or not. Anyway, so maybe I will skip this. I'm consuming time. And uh, using the, yeah, anyway, the, yeah, thanks to the, our success model, yeah, we obtained a nice uh, 3D supernova and the remnant uh, models for 87A. And using this model, we may tackle with some uh, properties of the undetected neutron star. I mean, in the yeah, center of the, the 87 we put the, our 3D model, and we assume some non-thermal component from the uh, undetected uh, neutron star. And uh, using yeah, the, the assumed uh, non thermal component can be uh, absorbed with our yeah, 3D model. And uh, uh, yeah, observed X ray spectra. Uh, yeah. Is what fraction of the energy comes from this neutron star? Uh, energy. Okay, so you observe this flowing ring, which puts out I don't know how many how many arcs per second are we are, are we talking about? Six so seven. let's go back. You got the four images. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, this ring, this the beautiful beaded ring. Yeah. How many arcs per second is that? Uh, I mean the distance. No, no, the energy. Oh, what energy. Is the luminosity? Has, we know we know the distance. You know, so how many Earths per second of energy is coming from this ring? Um, maybe, yeah, just showing the next slide. Actually, this is, uh, yeah, results. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know, can you convert this to Earths per second? Like, so more than 10 to the 33, more than 10 to the 35, like the sun, a lot less, a lot more. Okay, it doesn't matter. So whatever that number is, okay, let's say it's one solar luminosity. I have no idea what it is. Of the total energy coming out, you're saying, okay, you put a model, you put a you put a you know, neutron star inside mm -hmm. to account for part of the energetics. Mm -hmm. So of the total energy, is neutron star making up fifty percent, ninety-nine percent, one percent of the energy input? Uh, I maybe yeah. I in other words, if you, if you, if you, if you, let's, say, let's say there's no neutron star, mm -hmm. does your prediction change by a tiny amount or totally different? Or? Anyway, the, yeah, most of the emission will be absorbed. And if you see the, in the spectrum, the yeah, change 
uh, with or without. Okay. Maybe uh, I, I think I'm just asking a much simpler question. So in, you've got a slide saying maybe there's evidence for a neutron star. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a big deal of two. Yeah. So I'm just asking, okay, so what is your evidence? And I think what you're saying, I think what you're saying is if you, t if you don't have the neutron star, mm. something will look very different than the observations. Yeah. So what, what is it different? Maybe you could show two plots, one with the neutron star and one without. Yeah, yeah. And then we can compare. Yes. But observationally, if you see something really hard with the power law spectrum, that's we assume it is a pulsar wind nebula. Okay. But in shocks, it's a thermal plasma emission. The, the, the extra spectrums are completely different. So observationally, it's very very easy to differentiate between. No, I understand if, if you actually see the nebula. But I think what he is saying is that you don't see, for some reason, we don't, we don't, there's no direct evidence. That's actually, isn't it observing an X-ray? No, no, but he's, he's modeling the ring, right? He's modeling the secondary interaction. The ring is by shocks. Okay, the pulsar we never is a tiny thing in the background. Exactly, yeah. 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 as far as this is concerned, that's an extra energy source mm. that illuminates the outside. And the pulsar is responsible for that it's pulsar we nebula. If there's a pulsar, if there's a pulsar. No, no, but I think, I think, he, I think what he, maybe you should speak, because I think mm -hmm. we, we, have, we have different interpretations of what you think you're saying. So, um, the, I you were asking about the. Actually, we will not see the pulsar wing nebula, right? No, no, no. I, okay, no, I'm asking, what, what's the logic here? So, mm -hmm. the way I understood it is that there's currently no direct evidence of a mm -hmm. pulsar wing nebula from its own X ray emission. So, we don't actually, there's no, no compelling evidence, I think. But did yeah, you yeah. observe their heart? That's, that's a spectrum. Is it a spectrum? No, but, that, yeah. but that's, not that's, from the, that's, not from, that's not from the point source, that's from the whole thing. No, pulsar wing nebula is not yeah, from the point source, it's a diffuse emission. So the cloud is one parsec, it's one parsec in size, and it's a thousand years old. This thing will be point point one parsec in size to put the wind nebula. Because we often see pulsar wind nebula without seeing the pulsar. I know, but these are ancient po ancient pulsars. This is fifty years old. So this thing will be, you know, as an arc second in size, as seen from here. It's no, it is seventy seventy kiloparsecs. Seventy kiloparsecs. That's what we see. Okay. Not every pulsar is detecting X-ray. You can see the pulsar wind nebula easily. No, I understand, I understand, but I think that's not. That's my thing. You need to say something because yeah, yeah. What yeah. The, 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 the so one what you what you what you think you're saying? Okay, so what yeah. is this? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, now from the observational, yeah, it is uh, uh, difficult to distinguish by eye. I mean, this is a uh, recent result, the ensemble component. And uh, by eye, it is very difficult to distinguish the two things. And uh, but okay, no, no. I think I think a much lower order question. So there is a, there is a earlier you showed these pictures of a ring which is many arc seconds in size. Mm -hmm. The pulse of wind nebula would be less than one arc second, and you know, Chandra has a resolution of better of, of order than arc second. So is this the central pixel? Is it average? Is this a point? Is this a wave? Average, average. It's an average. Yeah. Um, but then how much of it is coming from the central point? Or do we know it's a, this is not from the central point? Do we know this is extended? Or do we know this is a point or not? Uh, as I understand, uh, maybe yeah, the, um, try, to, uh, yeah, com try to remove the contamination from the uh, link. And uh, yeah, we anyway, yeah, try to um, yeah, contamination, and uh, so maybe, let me check later, but uh, anyway, it should be, yeah, from the, our result, anyway, the... Okay, what about in your result? Your result is what? You see, you're actually modeling just the spectrum of some random pulse of wind nebula as measured and added to it, or you're taking the reprocessing of radiation from a pulse of wind nebula interacting with matter on the earth, because that's why you want, uh, I think, you say something different. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know. No, when, when we see a non-thermal power law spectrum from a planet, from a sort of resonant insect, it's a small source, that's a pulsar wind nebula. No, I understand that, but I don't think that's what he's saying. That's not what no, he's saying. No, no. Yeah. The <laughs> same as, uh, yeah. Uh, so, me. So, I think the way he just want to know about how much luminosity you can contribute from the central neutron, neutron star, pulsar, to, to this, the contribution. Because I, I think you're saying even if there's no neutron star, it would look very similar. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's the same. Due to the so absorption. We, so we cannot distinguish to tell whether there's a neutron star or not from this that we can because this is the extended emission, <laughs> whereas this photon would be this is a different thing, which is supposed to be a direct emission, which would be point light, and this is not. This is what he's saying, I think. Well, the change of resolution. The emission from the central point is uh, yeah, kind of a point light, but uh, it is uh, yeah, heated surrounded ejector, and uh, most of the emission from the such a surrounded uh, medium is absorbed, it. and uh, so if. Yeah, even if there is uh, some non-thermal component, uh, from the observation, it is very difficult to see the yeah, differences. And this is, uh, yeah, actually just results show that this uh, yeah, situation. OK. So uh, that means that the, the, the central pulsar luminosity, can we get the upper limit? What's the luminosity? Is like a soil, soil luminosity or much lower than so? Uh, in the can we get this kind of up-living? Yeah, it should be some of our limit, so let me check. Yeah, right there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the spectral shifting uh, and the analysis, yeah, maybe it is difficult to yeah, distinguish the binary, but the, uh, from the analysis, yeah, there are distinct, uh, different features, and we anyway suggested maybe the some thermal component, probably coming from the uh, pulsar wind nebula activity, is maybe necessary. It, this is not the direct evidence, but this is indirect uh, evidence of the existence of the neutron star. And uh, similar uh, constraint can be done uh, for the thermal emission from the undetected neutron star. And Akira uh, uh, is a young uh, uh, PhD uh, researcher, but uh, he recently uh, calculated the thermal evolution of the neutron star theoretically. And uh, from the yeah, observation, and constraint since we, uh, we have not detected uh, directly the uh, neutron star yet. And uh, using the, this constraint, we may yeah, say something on the properties of the neutron star. The, this result maybe yeah, will be yeah, coming from yeah, next year, early next year, hopefully. Anyway. And uh, it's uh, time, but uh, so for the cash uh, situation is uh, more uh, easy to, uh, it's not so complicated, but uh, anyway, the observationally, the distribution is very uh, yeah, strange. This is uh, edge, the observation uh, shown here, and uh, here some iron structure is shown, and you see the unknown jet like feature origin of the, this jet is very, uh, yeah, somehow mystery. And uh, anyway, the, from the observations, the analysis, yeah, the, the, this iron clumpy region are uh, observed to obtain some uh, features. And the uh, abundance ratio is, uh, compared with the uh, uh, theoretical calculation of nuclear synthesis. And uh, this uh, shows that the, uh, yeah, to obtain the observed abundance ratio, we suggested that the some uh, high entropy uh, region is necessary in the exposed nuclear synthesis. And this means that the yeah, high entropy plan may be suggested or, uh, yeah, it is uh, compatible with the uh, neutron neutral range mechanism. So high entropy, this is uh, another yeah, support for the Cassiopeia uh, explosion, maybe a uh, neutron neutral explosion. And uh, yeah, so our uh, collaborators uh, has uh, some nice uh, three-dimensional uh, simulation uh, 
uh, results. And this is accidentally, yeah, looks like the observed distributions of the Cassiopeia A. And uh, using this 3D neutron driven model, and uh, further evolution uh, followed. And uh, here is the distribution again iron, and the color means uh, velocity. And uh, yeah, this is a uh, kind of the uh, yeah, reverse shock. And after past the reverse shock, the finger strike structure is developed. And uh, yeah, using this uh, simple uh, simulation result, we may yeah, obtain some observed uh, features. For example, this is uh, distribution of unshocked iron and shocked uh, silicon. And uh, you may see the soon the shocked iron is, uh, as you can see, the very kind of filamentary distributed. And it uh, looks like iron is maybe outside the silicon uh, rich ejector. And uh, do, using this simple uh, calculation, we may yeah, uh, yeah, succeed to explain some qualitative yeah, features of that or cassé. And uh, it's time to yeah, close. So, but uh, briefly, what uh, now I am doing is uh, yeah, motivated by the yeah. Uh, Observation by Arma. Yeah, now I'm trying to the uh, yeah synthesis of the uh, chemical reaction. As I said uh, in the previous uh, shown figure, this is just a naive uh, estimation. So in reality, using the realistic summer evolution, we need to uh, calculate the chemical evolution. And uh, yeah, with uh, some approximations. And uh, fortunately, for the case of 1878, uh, there are observations of the vibrational transition band for the carbon monoxide for the early stages. Mm -hmm. And we need to explain this observation mm -hmm. with our bodies. But uh, to do this, it is uh, uh, still huge. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, still our approximation may be yeah, primitive. But anyway, I am trying to do the calculate the vibrational transition lines using the, uh, hopefully in the near future with uh, 3D models. And uh, I'm calculating using the, our 3D model, but uh, yeah, and using the uh, angular averaging, the 3D model is uh, approximated the one-dimensional profile. Mm -hmm. And using such a profile, yeah, we try to I, I, I try to calculate the uh, uh, yeah molecule formation, something like this. Mm -hmm. And the ARMA observation, yeah, estimated some yeah errors for the approximated abundance. And uh, some model can yeah explain uh, this one and some of it can, cannot. Anyway, the, during this phase, uh, also the dust formation is also ongoing. So in the reality, we need to uh, couple with the uh, dust formation calculation. But uh, as a first step, yeah, I'm trying to do, uh, yeah, calculate it. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the first result for the molecular formation calculation from us is, uh, yeah, hopefully next year, early, early next year, it will be uh, launched. Anyway, the, in this paper, I will uh, try to uh, investigate the impact of the matter and thing based on the, our 3D models. And uh, actually, by using a different, uh, yeah, a progenitor star, the, the appearance looks like something different, something like this. Mm -hmm. And actually, with this uh, model, in principle, yeah, I can yeah, estimate the spectral evolution for the vibrational transition of carbon monoxide. And uh, the wavelength should be yeah, compatible with the uh, 
newly launched JWST, and uh, our model, uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah, in the future observation of JWST can be uh, compared with uh, our model uh, using a 3D model for the first time. Okay, yeah, it's time, so let me close uh, my talk. Okay, thank you very much for uh, Do we have questions for for Melissa? Uh, so I have a quick one. So you mentioned that uh, there were even without modeling the triple rings, um, there were already arguments to suggest that the progenitor for rings could be a binary star. Uh, do you say something about fine tuning for single star model? Could you could you explain that a little bit more? Uh, one thing is uh, using uh, yeah single star evolution, <laughs> and as I said, uh, there are observation of the abundance uh, of the nebula, mm -hmm. and the nebula abundance shows some anomaly abundance ratio. And one thing is it is difficult to uh, explain such uh, nebula anomalies using a single star evolution. Okay. But the uh, binary merger case, yeah, thanks to the binary merger, and uh, I mean the companion main sequence that are uh, merged to the uh, yeah, main star's envelope. Uh -huh. And this yeah, changed the abundance ratio. And uh, some uh, binary merger model uh, successfully uh, yeah, explained uh, such an uh, anomalous abundance ratio. Uh -huh. I see. That. And, and, and then that, that nebula observation was pre-explosion or, or post-explosion? Pre-explosion. -pre okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Uh, do we have other questions for Omasa? Omasa, could you do the 3D flash simulation image? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the, the, the 24. So I don't I don't understand uh, one point uh, from this false image because uh, like if you are using a neutrino driven explosion, I don't quite understand. That's why it's a very kind of jet like structures on both. So in mm -hmm. in my model, yeah, I don't uh, specify the explosion mechanism. But uh, just the, the explosion mode is kind of a bipolar like explosion. It may prefer the uh, jet like explosion, but uh, I don't say it is a jet. But just a globally asymmetric explosion are just uh, yeah, reproduced. Is that what you call the magneto rotational explosion? I don't say this is a magneto. No, but you have a model, you, you assume something, no? So, yeah. I mean the initial, uh, I assume the initial asymmetric velocity, radial velocity distribution, and uh, such a distribution, uh, which mechanism such a dis distribution is, can be explained is still unknown. I mean, the, even the yeah, neutron driven explosion model, as you see the very first slide, the global morphology is, uh, looks like somehow similar, but the uh, inner structure can be yeah, different between the uh, neutron driven explosion and the jet-like magnetic rotational explosion. But the uh, uh, magnetic common, if we want to have this structure in a ejector that implies the central engine will work quite differently. And this strong kind of asymmetry structure, that will imply the central probably have a something like a jet, jet explosion type too. Because the neutrino, if you think the neutrino come out of more, more or less more isotropically, so may not driven this kind of large axis preference structures. Yeah, yeah. using a uh, neutrino driven explosion, yeah, to reproduce this kind of initial morphology is uh, very difficult, mm. I can say. Mm. No, I can accept why I keep going back to this question. 
So in a, in, a, in the rotational same time, it's maximally asymmetric, and that's natural. However, as you say, right, if you have neutrino driven explosion, the neutrinos are isotropic. And now I think what he's saying is that, well, but you've got a Sarsi instability, and even though the heating is isotropic, you have some complicated uh, oscillation leading to even for even though the energy is neutrino driven, you get a highly you know jet like um, outflow anyways, even though you know due to some complicated Sarsi resonance. I think is what you're saying. So the neutron driven explosion is also driven, yeah, of course driven by the neutron emission. And uh, normally the neutron emission more like spherical because it's uh, coming from the central compact object and it is uh, almost uh, spherical. But the uh, instability may uh, yeah, the evolve the fluctuation very asymmetrically. And this is a uh, yeah, neutron driven explosion. I mean, stochastically the distribution can be very asymmetric, but uh, it is difficult to reproduce the yeah, strict bipolar structure by using the uh, kind of uh, neutral driven explosion case. Okay, uh, so may I suggest that, I think the time is up, but may I suggest that we can move the discussion out uh, and yeah, yeah. have the tea and coffee together. And let's thank uh, all of you again. Much.